All right, continuing on physical chemistry, now we're starting chapter three, section one. So chapter three talks about the second law of thermodynamics. And just to refresh your memory from uh, chapter two, the first law says that um, the change in internal energy is just equal to Q plus W. And that's only true for a closed system, obviously, which is what we'll be talking about for now. Now, the conservation of energy tells us that the change in energy of the system is equal to the change in energy of the surroundings. Or put another way, and the change in energy of the system plus the change in energy of the surroundings is equal to zero, because the overall change in energy of the universe is equal to zero. Now remember, we're abbreviating SYS for system and SURR for surroundings. <clears throat> the first law does not place any restrictions on energy transfer, as long as you're conserving energy. Now, that brings up the obvious question, though. Let's well, say we have a chemical reaction, nitrogen gas plus hydrogen gas to give us ammonia gas. Where is the equilibrium going to be? The first law can't answer that question. Any going all the way to the right, all the way to the left would be perfectly valid under the first law of thermodynamics. But the second law of thermodynamics is going to allow us to come up with an answer to that question. Now the second law of thermodynamics, we're going to be talking about entropy, which is a state function that we're denoting capital S. Entropy tends to increase. That's going to become very important later on when we look at some of the uh, characteristics of entropy. And there are a couple different ways of stating the second law of thermodynamics. One is the Clausius statement. The Clausius statement is that it is impossible to devise an engine which, working in a cycle, shall produce no effect other than the transfer of heat from a colder body to a hotter body. It's very important that you understand why this is true. But it's not true for a process that's not cyclic, though. Only true for a cyclic process. Continuing on physical chemistry, chapter 3.1, we're uh, just now learning the second law of thermodynamics, and we um, did the Clausius statement. This is what the Clausius statement was saying. If we have a system connected to two reservoirs, one with higher temperature than the other, it is impossible to pump heat from the, well, it's impossible to have no other effect than to pump heat from the cold reservoir to the hot reservoir. This is why it actually takes energy, such as electricity, to operate a refrigerator. Now there's another way of stating the second law of thermodynamics, that's the Kelvin-Planck statement. The Kelvin-Planck statement says it is impossible, in a cyclic process again, to convert heat into work with 100% efficiency. This is a diagram showing what it's talking about. If you have a heat reservoir, you've got heat, Q, heat going into a cyclic machine, and then work coming out, Ideally, you would want the work output to be equal to minus Q, but this, according to the Kelvin-Planck statement, is impossible. <clears throat> Continuing on chapter 3.1 in physical chemistry, now we're going to talk about what a heat engine. A heat engine is just like this. It's a cyclic process. It connects to a heat reservoir and a cold reservoir, and it does work. So we're going to have heat coming in from the hot reservoir, heat going out to the cold reservoir, and the work coming out. And that's going to be our work done by the system. So for a heat engine operating forward then, our QH is going to be greater than zero, our work is going to be less than zero, and our QC is going to be less than zero. Now the engine's got some sort of working substance in it, it can be anything. Our system is a closed system, operating in a cycle, obviously, and the whole point is to use heat to perform work. <clears throat> Continuing on our uh, physical chemistry, chapter 3, section 1, <coughs> we're talking about heat engines. Uh, lowercase e is the efficiency of our heat engine. The efficiency is whatever work output divided by the energy input. Now remember, work is actually coming out, um, so we're going to put a minus sign in with that, so we end up with a positive value. So we're going to end up work divided by Q. Just to show it's positive, we're going to end up with we're going to show this absolute value of W divided by Q because we need we want efficiency this positive number. It's a ratio that's going to end up between zero and uh, one. Now remember, for a cyclic process, delta U is equal to zero. 
That's because delta u is a state function, and any state function is equal to zero for a cyclic process. Now, the first law then is going to be q plus w equals zero. Here we have two different q's, though. We have qh and qc plus w equals zero. We're going to solve for qh then, so that just gives us qh is equal to minus w plus minus qc. The reason we do this is so you can see the heat we have coming into our system is effectively being split out two ways. One is the useful work we're doing, and two is this necessary evil, the heat that we're sending to our cold reservoir. Now there's actually, you can't really proof or derive the second law of thermodynamics, but there is uh, e evidence based, you know. For one, let's say that you uh, have some sort of machine that you connect to the oceans. The oceans have temperature, they have thermal energy, it seems like you could just pump Q out of the oceans and turn it into useful work. But it turns out, no, that is impossible. Well, the second comment, I don't even understand it, but I'm going to show you anyway. Hopefully, if you understand it, you can explain it to me. So we have the derivative of pressure with respect to temperature. That's equal to the change in enthalpy of vaporization divided by temperature times the change in volume. Capital V is volume in this case. And this would be something for, like, um, water boiling. <clears throat> Continuing on chapter 3, the heat engine stuff. This is actually 3.2. I was labeling it section 3.1 earlier. But anyway, so the first law to summarize, um, we're talking about energy. You can't win. You can only break even. The second law of thermodynamics, just summarized, you can't even break even, you're going to lose. Now, to be more specific, let's talk about the efficiency of a heat engine. Now, I already showed you before how it's calculated, but let's go over that again, though. So, E is equal to minus W work over QH, and we want it, just to verify as a positive number, we write as the absolute value of work over QH. Now, remember the QH, then, if you were to solve for that, it's going to be equal to QH plus QC. So we substituted that in here, and then we're going to just simplify this. So our, inner, our efficiency is equal to 1 plus QC over QH. Remember, QC is coming out of the system, so it's negative. QH is going into the system, so it's positive. So this ratio here is going to be a negative number. So we're going to end up with an efficiency less than 1 for any real heat engine. Now, of course, when we do the calculations, we're going to assume that the temperature of our hot reservoir and cold reservoir are constant. Obviously, if you're drawing heat out of the hot reservoir, you might actually cool it down. That'll just make the math more complicated, and there's no reason to do that right now. Now, let's talk about Carnot's principle. There's two different types of E we're going to be talking about. There's the E efficiency of any real engine operating between a hot reservoir and a cold reservoir. And there's also reversible. So if we have some sort of reversible engine, that's going to be, you know, the efficiency of that engine is going to be denoted irreversible. Carnot's principle is that the energy, or no, the efficiency of a real system is less than or equal to the efficiency of a reversible engine. Now keep in mind though, reversible is an approximation we're using for the purpose of calculations. In real life, you can try to approximate it by, you know, reducing the number of parts you have and to lubricate the number of parts and so on. Continuing on physical chemistry, chapter 3.2, um, we're going to talk about the efficiency of heat engines some more. Now, what we've done here is connect a pair of heat engines together. So they're connected to the same hot reservoir, temperature TH, and the same cold reservoir, temperature TC. What we've done is we've taken the output work of reversible engine A and driven that into reversible engine B to drive it backwards. So A is going to take hot heat from the hot reservoir and convert it to work, and then B is going to take that work and pump heat from the cold reservoir back into the hot reservoir. And both of these are reversible engines. Therefore, if we could do this for real, this would be perpetual motion. So Carnot's principle, remember, said that the, uh, if an engine is operating, it has to be less, has efficiency less than or equal to the efficiency of a reversible engine. So when we're running everything forward like this, we can stay, say from Carnot's principle that 
the efficiency of reversible engine A is less than or equal to the efficiency of reversible engine B. Now, if we were to take all these zeros and reverse it, so A is, or B is the one operating forward, and then A is the one being driven backwards, then we could conclude that the efficiency of reversible engine B is less than or equal to the efficiency of reversible engine A. Since these are both less than or equal to each other, then we have to conclude that the efficiency of reversible engine A has to be equal to the efficiency of reversible engine B. Now we actually can conclude two different things from this right here. One is that all reversible engines operating between the same two temperature must have the same efficiency. And remember that's heat engines because this is only true if you're operating in a cycle. Heat engines operate in a cycle. Now, the second thing we conclude then is that the efficiency of a reversible engine is the maximum efficiency for any heat engine that operates between these two temperatures. So what we can say then is that the efficiency of an irreversible engine, IRREV is how we're abbreviating irreversible, is less than or equal to the efficiency of a reversible engine. And of course, REV is just reversible. But keep in mind though, the efficiency of a reversible engine is totally theoretical. Like I said, otherwise we'd be able to build ourselves a perpetual motion machine. Okay, continuing on in section 3.2 of physical chemistry, we're learning about the Carnot cycle. Um, this is what the Carnot cycle actually look like, looks like. We've got a PV diagram here. We've got four steps in the cycle, numbered one, two, three, four, and then you come back into one. You must come back to exactly where you started because it's a cyclic process. Now, we've got four steps here then. Step one to two, this is isothermal expansion. This is at our hot temperature from our heat reservoir. Then from step two to three, we have adiabatic expansion. This, of course, is when the temperature is going to cool down to TC. Then from step three to four, we have isothermal compression. This is at our cool temperature, obviously. And then from step four, back up to one, we have adiabatic compression, where our system returns back to um, temperature TH. Now, for the non-adiabatic steps, our isothermal steps, obviously, our expansion then will be when QH is greater than zero, and our compression will be when QC is less than zero. So an ice, our kind of cycle has two isotherms and two adiabats. All four steps we're doing reversibly, because um, it's, we're assuming it's a reversible engine right now. And, well, we only know how to calculate reversible processes. <clears throat> then uh, we're going to assume that our system is going to do PV work only, and we're going to work with an ideal gas. Again, that's not necessarily true in real life. It's just that's all we know how to calculate for now. We're going to just simplify the math as much as we can. Now, remember, the first law of thermodynamics said that the differential of internal energy U is equal to dQ plus dW, and we also know that dW is equal to minus PdV. Therefore, we know that dU is equal to dQ minus PdV. We also know that dU is equal to C, the uh, heat capacity at constant volume, times the differential of temperature. Now, we also know, then, by transitivity of equality, that CU dT is equal to dQ minus PdV. Let's see, then what did we do here? Okay. Then using the ideal gas law, we substitute it in for P. So we have CV dT is equal to dQ minus nRT over V dV. The reason we did this, of course, is so that we could um, end up doing calculus later on. Now we're going to take that equation and we're going to divide by temperature. So we end up CV over T times the differential of temperature is equal to dQ over temperature minus nR over V, because the T's cancel out, times the differential of volume. Continuing on chapter 3.2 of physical chemistry, we're talking more about the Carnot cycle. We showed that um, the heat capacity constant volume divided by temperature times the differential of temperature is equal to the differential of heat divided by temperature minus NR divided by V times the differential of volume. Now remember, a cyclic integral here, or closed integral, we're going to take the cyclic integral of all these separately, remember, you can do that with addition of subtraction. So, Cyclic integral of this CV of T, we're showing this is a function of temperature, divided by temperature, with respect to temperature, 
is equal to the cyclic integral of dq divided by t minus the cyclic integral of nRv with times the differential of volume. Now, um, <clears throat> closed integral of any state function or a product of state functions is equal to zero. For example, the closed integral of PV would be equal to zero. So now we know this term up here, so closed uh, cyclic integral of NR over V is equal to zero. We also know this term is equal to zero. The closed, cy closed um, cyclic integral of CV of T divided by T with respect to T is equal to zero. And then likewise, the, the closed cyclic integral of uh, internal energy is equal to zero, or uh, internal energy with respect to U is one over U is DU is also equal to zero. Any product of state functions yield closed cyclic integral will be equal to zero like that. <clears throat> Continuing on physical chemistry, chapter 3.2, we're still talking about the Carnot cycle. There's a lot to say about it. Keep in mind the four steps from the previous diagram. So we showed before that the closed cyclic integral of CV as a function of temperature divided by T with respect to temperature is uh, equal to zero because that's a state function. No, no, never mind, that's something else, sorry. Okay, so we got, anyway, we're gonna split this into the four steps here. So the step from one to two, two to three, three to four, and four back to one. So we just copy that over. So we have CV of T divided by T for step one, CV of T divided by T, step two, etc. So each one of these, um, integrals for an isotherm is going to be equal to zero because the temperature is the same. You're not going anywhere. Likewise, any integral, like from two to three or four to one, th those two are going to be the same magnitude. They're going to cancel out. So what that shows us is that for all four of these steps here, that the um, closed cyclic integral of dq over t is equal to zero. What this tells us then is that dq over t is a state function. I was getting out of myself earlier. That's what I was trying to say. Okay, so since we're going to break that up the same way. So the closed cyclic integral of dq over t, so it's going to be the integral from 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to 4, and 4 back to 1. Each one of those is dq divided by the appropriate temperature. Now, at temp from 1 to 2 and for 3 to 4, we have constant temperature hot temperature, cold temperature. Now for two to three and four to one, those are adiabats. So dq is gonna be equal to zero. And well, and therefore q will be equal to zero, obviously. So what that's gonna do is we're gonna simplify that out then. So our integral becomes one divided by th, because that's a constant you can pull out of the integral of just state one to state two of dq plus one over the cold temperature, again, we pulled that out because it's a constant, times the integral from state three to four of dq. And we still know this is equal to zero because we showed that it must be a state function. Okay, physical chemistry, section 3.2, we're finally finishing up the Carnot cycle. We showed before um, we got ourselves a closed cyclic integral. So integrating that, we get QH over TH plus QC over TC is equal to zero. We can rearrange that a little bit to get QH over TH is equal to QC or minus QC over TC. Or we could get QC over QH is equal to minus TC over TH. Now what, remember before we derived the formula, the efficiency of a reversible engine is equal to one plus QC over QH. So now we can use that to substitute back in and say that the efficiency of a reversible engine is equal to one minus the cold temperature divided by the hot temperature. Or we could um, distribute that common denominator and get um, the hot temperature minus the cold temperature divided by the hot temperature is equal to the efficiency of a reversible engine. And this is true no matter what your working substance is. Um, it doesn't matter. <clears throat> 